a few more people kind of filtering in. I'll admit them as they come in. Uh, just a quick overview of the Zoom rules one more time. Uh, please keep yourself muted because there, there can be a lot of background noise. Um, and I'd like to have kind of as little background noise as possible for people listening. And then questions, you can write it in the chat or if you have a real uh, need to be heard, you can raise your hand at the end of the presentation and I will um, ask you to unmute and you can ask it to me personally. But chat tends to be the easier way to ask questions. Uh, okay, so with that, I'm gonna get started. So today's presentation or today's webinar is on birds that you're feeded, feeder presented by me. Many of you probably recognize me uh, from <laughs> some of the other webinars. Uh, and what we're going to be talking about today is birds at your feeder, but specifically winter birds at your feeder. We're not going to be talking a lot about feeding birds in April. I'm happy to ask questions, but I focus the presentation on kind of stuff you're going to be seeing right now. So if you have feeders, stuff you might be seeing in your feeders right now, or if you don't have feeders, if you put up feeders, this is what you might be seeing. Uh, so I just wanted to start with a little video, quick video on uh, a, kind of what a typical site you might be seeing at your feeders um, if you were up at like seven o'clock in the morning today or eight o'clock in the morning. So just a few birds. Um, those are feeders out in the woods at Henry Marsh. And this bird was also for, uh, videoed at Henry Marsh. So that's kind of like a typical what you're going to be seeing right now. Uh, so about me, before we get into the meat of the presentation, uh, just so you know, for those of you who don't know who I am, so you know who I am, uh, I'm the Land Stewardship Coordinator with Muskoka Conservancy, and I'm a very avid birder and naturalist. I've been birding my whole life, pretty much. I remember a presentation that I gave in high school or maybe middle school where we had to prepare a science pr project. And my project was what feeders attract what birds. And of course I was in, I don't know, grade nine or something at the time. So I set up a bunch of feeders in my backyard. And because I was in school, my mom did all the science and collected all the data for me. And I just compiled it at the end. Um, so I have been birding for quite a number of years, but I've really been like, hardcore birding for about five years um, now. I started in 2017. And I actually set the Muskoka big year record uh, in 2020. So two years ago, I set the record uh, at 219 species seen in Muskoka in one year. Uh, so I, I'm excited for when someone beats that because there are a lot of good birds in 2020. Uh, I'm also a very avid naturalist. I do a lot of dragonfly and butterfly work. Uh, if you see me out on the trails or anywhere, I'll probably have binoculars and a camera and a notepad and look like I just stepped out of a wetland. So uh, as you can see in the photo, I, I live in nature and uh, that's what I love to do. And to get a sense of what you can be seeing in your yard, our total yard list where I live in Bracebridge, in town in Bracebridge, is 96 species. So we've seen 96 species uh, probably in the last four years in our yard is when I started, started our yard list. And that includes some really unusual stuff. So we have like common loon on our yard list, which we don't live near a body of water or there isn't one too close, but it was just flying over the house one day. And I have a killdeer, which flew over at 10 p.m., uh, so there's a lot of stuff you can add just from having your windows open at night. Like I have a screech owl that was car calling in the middle of Bracebridge, uh, just, you know, happened to be passing through. Uh, so we're going to be talking mainly about winter feeding, but you can still add some pretty unusual stuff in the winter as well. And then about Muskoka Conservancy, we currently protect uh, around 48 properties across Muskoka. I know there's some recent land acquisition, so it might be maybe one more than that. Uh, and they total about 3,200 acres. It's, uh, it's over 3,200 acres now. And across those properties, we protect around 600 acres of wetland and about 50,000 feet of shoreline. We also provide habitat for uh, our latest count, official count was 21 species at risk. 
but with some of the recent finds in the last year, it's probably closer to 25 or 26 species at risk now. So a lot of uh, at-risk species use our properties. Um, and it's pretty exciting to get out onto them because you see some very uh, interesting and unique stuff out there as well. So into the presentation, I want to make I want to make you feel assured right now that you know you don't have to be a crazy good birder to see a lot of birds. And if you haven't seen a lot of birds, it's not because you're not an amazing birder. We've only had 15 species of birds in our yard this year, so it's not like I'm seeing a bunch of stuff you're not seeing. It's just we don't have a lot of birds in the winter. Winter is a very slow time to be bird watching in Muskoka. However, it is the absolute best time to start. And everyone asks me in May <laughs> when I'm out, like it's May 15th and there's 20 species of warblers passing through. And they say, boy, this is a really hard thing to do. Like, how do you identify these hundreds of birds that are coming through? And I say, the best time to start is not right now. The best time to start is in the winter because it gives you the chance to familiarize yourself with the current species, the stuff you're going to see all year in Muskoka. And once you know those, when you see something weird or unusual, it's easy to pick it up and easy to recognize it as something different. The other reason is if you start now, when things start coming through at the end of February, so when our blackbirds come back, you're going to be familiar with what's around and then you'll you'll have to learn a couple species of blackbirds and then you'll have to learn a couple species of sparrow and then a couple of the early warblers so you're only ever having to learn maybe five birds at a time and then when may hits and millions of birds are flying through muskoka and you're looking at the 20 species of warbler it's going to be confusing but you'll at least have some of them down you'll know what some of those birds are. So start now, start familiarizing yourself with what you're seeing now, and hopefully it's gonna make your birding into May and June much easier. And so that's what this presentation is about. It's about how to start birding and how to, and more so how to refine your birding. So when we get to our spring migration webinar or our spring, spring migration nature quest, you're not standing out in the woods with me totally overwhelmed. So the first thing to do when you're looking at bird feeders and feeder birds is figure out what you're looking for first. And this is what is often overlooked when people start birding is they don't, they don't realize what their eyes are already trained to look for. So if you'd like to enter in chat, what is the first thing you see about this bird? What's the first thing that pops out to you when you're looking at this bird? Now, I'll give you a couple seconds to write in chat because not everyone is gonna have the same thing. And so color and size, red, yep. That the red waxy wing tips, markings on wings, shape and color, red tail, yep, wing bars. So there's lots of different things people are seeing. Um, I'm gonna turn my little laser pointer on. And the, the interesting thing about this bird, um, and the reason I use this bird is because my friend, who's also a very good birder, have a, both of us have a very distinct way of looking at this bird. And this is a bohemian waxwing. So in the summer, we have cedar waxwings. In the winter, bohemian waxwings come down from the north. When I look at this bird, I see these markings on the wings. So I see these waxy yellow, white, and red on the wings. Now, cedar wax wings only have these little red markings on the wings. They don't have all this yellow and white and other colors. They only have the little red on the wings. So that's how I tell a bohemian wax wing. My friend said, <laughs> when, I, when I told him that, he said, how do you possibly ID that bird on that? The only way I can, I, I can tell the difference is looking at this kind of reddy orange color on the underside of their tail. So this is the undertail coverts and bohemian waxwings have this really kind of rusty orangey red color. And you don't see that in cedar waxwings. So 
he looks for that. I look for the markings on the wings. Um, other people might be able to tell from the face, the mask on the face, this black marking on the face, but they have, you know, they have a crest here. They have a clear unmarked breast. Their beak shape, I know someone said that is much different. Um, it's kind of a little bit more curved than you might expect. But figure out what your eyes see first, because that's going to be what immediately pulls you to a bird. It's going to be the first thing you see. And from that information, you can start narrowing it down. So for example, if this Rufus uh, undertail coverts is the first thing you see, well, you're in luck because that's a really diagnostic feature for these birds. But it's going to prove uh, harder for things like maybe sparrows who don't have a lot of difference in their undertail coverts and you have to look for other things. So if you know what your eyes are already seeing, when you start looking at a lot of different birds, you can figure out where you need to be looking um, to distinguish them. Some, so some species are going to be easy for you to ID. Some are going to be more difficult just because what your, what your eyes are going to be seeing first. So I've got another test. What do you see first on this bird? Different, different species of bird. So you can write in chat what you're seeing first. And again, this is a really interesting group of birds. So these are warblers. I'll tell you that much. Um, and this one, well, I'll tell you what species of warbler this is as well. This is a yellow rumped warbler. Um, so someone saw the yellow crest first, someone saw the yellow bum first, the yellow markings, long thin beak. Um, some people might uh, see these white eye arcs. So it's not a complete white eye ring exactly. It's got some arcs. Pattern of feathers, the yellow, there's some, some black kind of streaking on the breast. There's white wing bars. So warblers are super interesting in that I had to train myself to be able to identify well, because in warblers, you want to look for things like wing bars and wing bars are the last thing I look at in a bird, these white patches on the wings. I don't see, I don't see those until that's like the last thing I see. So I had to train myself when I identify a warbler, I see, you know, this, this butter, butt, the yellow, butt but also the long thin bill is diagnostic of a warbler. So I had to train myself, look at the wings, look at the wings. You have to look at the wings. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to identify it because there's some birds that look very similar and wing bars are the only thing that separate them. So you'll have to learn how to train your eyes, but figuring out what you're seeing first is gonna help you train your eyes for the different species of birds. Um, so it's often overlooked. People don't really think about what they're naturally drawn to, but I like to highlight that because that's going to make your birding journey a lot easier. Figure out what your eyes are already looking at, and then you can refine your identification skills from there. So other tips to identify birds. Um, write notes, and this is something people don't do as well. If you don't recognize a bird, write notes on it because your brain has a lovely habit of changing things that you saw because when you open up your field guide, you're going to see a bird that looks very similar and say, that was it. I definitely saw these five diagnostic features, whether you saw them or not, because it looks similar. So I have several times written notes about birds that I don't recognize, opened a field guide, saw, oh, that bird definitely was the one I saw, reread my notes and it said streaking on breast. And I look at the bird and there's no streaking on the breast. So writing notes is going to help you a lot, especially you can write notes about the way it calls. You can write notes about habitat and behavior. That's the third point, observing that habitat and behavior, because your, your brain can play tricks on you and uh, it's very off, very easy to jump to the rarest bird you might see, as opposed to looking at your notes or notes that you've written and realizing that, oh, maybe it's not the rarest thing in the field guide. Maybe it's something a bit more common. Or if you have good notes, maybe it is the rarest thing in the field guide. Um, there's a lot of rare birds identified just from quick sketches people drew of the bird that they saw. So notes are really, really useful in being able to narrow down your identification. The other thing is photos. So we have a nice photo of a pair of common loons. Um, they were breeding. You can actually sort of see the chicks in the background here. Uh, taking photos, some species of birds, this is going to be way better on um, than others. Shorebirds are a key example. 
I have I have spent the last three years out in Georgian Bay at my cottage identifying shorebirds. And I can tell you, if I didn't take a photo of it, that shorebird doesn't exist because shorebirds are very, very tricky to ID sometimes. And I've actually gone back to photos a month later, looked at them and realized that I had them identified wrong. So if you can get photos, even if it's just like a cell phone cam photo, it will help a lot in figuring out where you need to look. Um, the other interesting photo I have is a photo of three least sandpipers all right next to each other. And you, if you looked at it, you would think these are three different species of birds because of the way their plumage is different. And they're three of the exact same species of birds. Their plumages are just very different. So taking photos, uh, especially for things like warblers and shorebirds and gulls are really are really, it's a good habit to get into. Um, and then the last point, which I'm, I'm gonna hammer in, become familiar with the birds around you. Once you know what shows up in your yard every single day, it's gonna be so much easier to figure out where the really weird ones are. Um, and if you've, if you've ever gone gull watching with someone, uh, it, gulls have about four different plumages they go through. And so when you're gull watching, it's very easy to look at a gull in a different plumage and say, wow, that's a different species. But once you become familiar with those gulls, the weird ones start to pop out a lot quicker because you'll scan the group and say, that one looks way different than what I'm used to. Um, so become familiar with the birds around you and it makes, uh, makes your identification much easier when you have something really, really odd. So I'm going to talk about feeders um, and a little bit about seed. Um, I got a question about some seed that um, that you're feeding birds. I can give you some tips on that as well um, as we're going through the feeders. I'm going to talk about four different feeder types uh, and what you feed, what the feeders that you use in your yard. Um, I would say the best thing is a variety of feeders. Have a good mix of them, but use like there's no bad feeder bird seed is bird seed birds will come to seed no matter where you put it they'll figure out where it is uh there are ways to attract specific birds but if you're just looking to look at birds having bird seed is more important than any specific feeder and there are so i'm sure there's some guides saying this feeder will attract you know hundreds of species of birds or this this is the perfect feeder for cardinals and you know knowing what's in your area is going to be a lot easier than just you know creating a feeder that you think a specific bird is going to come to they're a lot more generalists about what they do than people give them credit for so first type is a platform feeder um, i'm going to give you my experience and i'm sure i'm going to get some messages in the chat saying no you're wrong i've seen this bird come to a different feeder my experiences are not gospel. Um, I can tell you I've seen some weird things on my feeders in the past. I've seen birds that come to feeders that I've never seen them come to before. This winter was the first time I saw a dark eye junco come to a tube feeder. Uh, so don't take my word as gospel, take it as my experiences and maybe general observations. Um, so our platform feeders are a nice flat feeder. Roof is optional. Uh, roof is pretty good in the winter um, because snow will melt and freeze and if there's not a lot of snow because there's a roof the seed is going to be a little bit more available for the birds but we have a platform feeder without roof and we have one without a roof and we get pretty similar results at both of them as long as you're kind of keeping your feeders clean and cleared off of snow uh, so the birds in the picture are evening grosbeaks you can tell they're a finch uh, grosbeak is a species of finch by the really large conical bills they have. Those are adapted to like break open cones and seeds. I'll usually put uh, black oil sunflower seeds on these. Uh, you can add peanuts, you can add cracked corn, things like that. Peanuts are, blue jays love peanuts. Uh, if you want lots of blue jays in your yard, just throw some peanuts, whole peanuts out there and you'll have tons of blue jays. Um, if you don't want blue jays, whole peanuts are <laughs> not what you want to be using. Um, so you can tell, the other thing to note about this photo is the difference between the male and the female. Um, we've got the male is the bright yellow with this like eyebrow of yellow, this really bold eyebrow that they have. 
The female is a lot more gray um, with a little bit of yellow. Uh, if you're cleaning this feeder, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, one of the benefits of platform feeders is because they're so, they tend to be larger, they don't get quite as dirty. Uh, I would say for the most part, if you try to like soap it down when the weather warms up, um, just like a quick wash with some water maybe and uh, like a little bit of soap is probably the best thing you can do for them. They're pretty tricky. Uh, but often I'll just use a shovel to kind of scoop out any of the excess discarded seeds or things like that. So that's another way to just kind of keep it generally clean and then try to wash it once the weather warms up. I would say if you're trying to wash it or anything like during the winter, you're just going to end up with a frozen feeder. So just try to keep it clear of detritus and stuff like that. And then maybe wash it before winter starts and then after uh, winter wraps up. Uh, and birds only get like five to 10% of their, uh, food from feeders. So we often only feed in the winter and stop feeding as soon as kind of our last winter finch leaves because we don't want bears. Um, but you can feed year round. I know people that feed year round. It's really up to you, uh, on how much you want to be spending on bird seed, which is usually uh, what it ends up being. Um, and yeah, so this is an evening grow speak. Uh, you might see them on your feeders. We had a really, really good year two years ago. They were flying everywhere. Um, so this one is an eruptive species where you're going to get a variation in the population during the winter. Um, but often you'll see these kind of pop up in your feeders. We've seen a couple this year at our feeders, but the year that I took this, they were everywhere people had flocks of like hundreds at their feeders it was like an unreal year for them uh so next feeder type is a tube or a hopper feeder hoppers just tend to be a little bit wider uh the bird on this one is a carolina wren uh one of the uh, only wren species we get in muskoka and a very rare wren species in muskoka overall they tend to be a little bit further south, but we've had in the past couple of years, a few more have been showing up. Uh, you can tell this one from some of the other wrens you might see at your feeder because of the, the distinct supercillum, the eye line it has. And that kind of, you can't really see it too well in this photo, but it's got kind of a buffier color to the underside. Um, so your two popper feeders, you can fill these with niger seeds, which are really good for smaller finches. You can fill it with uh, black oil sunflower seeds. Some people use mixed seeds, so with some millet in there. I, I tend to get ma a majority of black oil sunflower seeds and then like one bag of mixed seed for the entire winter and just kind of put a little bit out there. Uh, I don't find much likes the millet besides blackbirds. So, I mean, it's great in the spring when everything defrosts and all the millets on the ground and we get flocks of 50 blackbirds. It's kind of fun to pick through their, them to see if there's anything rare. But um, the majority, like I would highly recommend black oil sunflower seeds over any of the mixes that have the millet in it. Because often when I'm clearing off the feeders, there's just millet left. Um, so a lot of birds don't like that. Uh, tube hoppers will be great for your uh, smaller finches like goldfinches and siskins, it's good for wrens, it's good for nuthatches, chickadees. You'll see the occasional blue jay, you'll see the occasional woodpecker. Uh, you'll see the occasional sparrow, but sparrows tend to like another feeder, which I'll uh, talk about in a little bit. Uh, we have suet feeders. Suets are, suet is great in the winter. Uh, everyone out there has their own tried and true suet recipe. So if you're looking for a good suet to give to the birds, just ask the, the other person that you know that feeds birds, because I can tell you that I've heard pretty much everyone that feeds birds regularly has their own suet mix that they like that attracts the woodpeckers. Uh, so in this photo is a white-breasted nuthatch feeding on suet, and the suet is store-bought suet. Uh, I, I'd recommend not using the squares of suet that you get from like home hardware. I find the birds don't like that as much as other stuff you can use. So there's kind of like a peanut butter mix. Uh, I just saw a question asking if peanut butter is harmful. I've never had issues with it. 
Um, and I think there's a bark butter as well, which uses peanut butter mainly. Um, uh, I've seen peanut butter mixed with seeds. Uh, I've seen raw suet. So some people have used the raw suet, melted it down and added some seeds. What we use now is my dad hunts, uh, gets a deer up in Kenora every year. And we just use the deer suet, um, from that. And we just put the raw suet out and the woodpeckers love it. So there's really no wrong suet. I just find that the store-bought squares tend to be less effective at attracting birds. So I would recommend you can go to the supermarket and ask for some of the suet they have left over, um, or you can prepare your own and there's tons of good recipes out there. I've also seen those like suet bells and suet balls. I've seen those used quite frequently by birds, um, but it's, it's just this kind of squares that I used to use that I, I found not a lot of success with. I um, mean, that's great. So it's great for woodpeckers. You'll see t every species of woodpecker will come to that. Good for nut hatches. You'll see the occasional chickadee, the occasional blue jay there. Uh, if you're really lucky in the spring, uh, you might get warblers. So pine warblers and yellow rumped warblers, which are kind of the first warblers that show up, might come to sue it if there's like a cold snap when they arrive. Uh, but I tend to stop feeding suet when temperatures go above freezing because since we use like a meat-based suet, it spoils and you don't really want your birds eating that. But like a peanut butter-based suet is probably going to be fine if you use it into the uh, spring because it's not going to spoil as quickly um, when it's left out there. So if you're using meat-based, probably take it in after temperatures get to like above zero. If you're using a peanut butter base or something like that, you're probably fine. And then the last type of fe feeder is ground. I have a question mark because it's not really a feeder, but it's where you're going to get most of your sparrows and a lot of finches too. And if you have flocks of dove in, dove in your neighborhood, you'll get your doves coming to this too. So our ground feeder is basically just the spilled seed uh, from like the excess you know, birds dropping seeds as they try to feed from the platform feeder or from a tube feeder. And sparrows are, I wouldn't say exclusively ground feeders, but are, they love to feed on the ground. And I can tell you every single spring when sparrows start migrating north, our, our like woods are just filled with them. And there's tons of them feeding from all the spilled seed. So Usually what we do is as we kind of knock the excess seed off the feeders in the spring, we'll just kind of rake it out into the grass. And, uh, you know, I can't, I can't guarantee that it's not spoiling, but if you spread it out to give some airflow to the seeds, it's usually fine. And the birds are pretty good at being able to tell like what's spoiled seed and what's not, and they won't use it. Um, the chipmunks do tend to, it does attract the chipmunks and the squirrels, but it attracts a lot of sparrows. And I can tell you on a good day in the spring, we can get five to eight species of sparrows in our yard. So uh, if you leave the spilled uh, seed out there, I can, I can say you'll probably get some interesting stuff coming to it. Uh, this bird right here in the foreground is a dark-eyed junco. Uh, it's leucistic. So there's some pigmentation issues where the, where the white is coming through. So normally the whole face would be kind of that slate gray color. Um, and that top tail feather, instead of this, this really bright white here, it would actually be a dark uh, gray or black. And that's why when I was saying, like, figure out what's normally in your yard, because then these weird things will stick out to you. Like this one, I thought I didn't have a dark eye junk. I, I was flipping to the rare sparrow section of the book. Uh, but it's still a really interesting thing to see. Um, and it'll be much easier to see them once you're familiar with everything. Um, and if you, if you really want to attract some like additional ground feeders, you can even spill some seed purposely on the ground. I'll do that when my parents aren't looking, uh, <laughs> cause they don't like attracting all the squirrels, but it's a good way to get a, a, like a little bit more of a variety. And this bird in the, the background there, that's a pine siskin. So that's a smaller finch species. And so they'll feed on the ground as well. Uh, the only reason I can really tell is this yellow flash in the wings. Pine siskin have this little burst of yellow in the in the wing there. Um, and yes, my dog eats the seed as well. He's uh, she's a a very avid seed eater. <laughs>
Um, okay, so we're going to get into uh, some groups of winter species in the last portion of this uh, presentation. And what I've done is I've grouped them into kind of families or genuses. I'm not going to give you the specific species except the ones in the photos, because from my experience, uh, slamming you with 20 species of birds is not an effective way of teaching you how to identify them. And the reason I say that is because I went to South Africa in 2019 and I read the field guide of African birds front to back. I read like 1200 species accounts of birds. And I can tell you when I got there, I remembered like five of them. So the reason I tell you to group them and figure out how to identify a group is when I read that field guide, I could narrow down a species that I saw to a group of birds that I was familiar with. I just couldn't identify it to species. So at least I knew where to look in the field guide. So that's kind of the idea here is I'm giving you the tools to know where to look in your field guide. And then your homework is to figure out where the, like figure out what species in the field guide it is. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm giving you most of the work and then you're just narrowing it down to species. This guy is a pretty interesting owl species. It's a northern hawk owl, and it is very rarely seen in Muskoka. Every maybe six to ten years, we'll see them. And their owls are, or many of our owls are, eruptive species, which is I R R U P T, and that just means that they have these cyclical swings in population, where suddenly we'll see like an explosion of them. So northern hawk owls. We see like that once every six to 10 years, but that sixth year where we see them, they're being seen everywhere. So the year that this one was seen, there was like five others reported across Southern Ontario. And then my aunt sent me a photo of two of them that she had sitting in a tree in Kenora. Uh, so they're pretty rare, but when we do see them like snowies, you're gonna see lots of them, or you know, they're gonna be seen frequently throughout Ontario. And the way you can tell this is a northern hawk owl, it's a bit of a smaller owl, and it's got this kind of, I like to call it kind of like an M on its face, like this very distinct edge of its facial disc. Uh, so that's a good thing to look for for this guy. But again, you're not going to see him a lot. So if you think you see him, take a photo and send me a photo of it, because I will, uh, I'll let you know whether you have one or not. So leading into that, our first group of owls. Um, is owls, they have prominent facial discs. So this, you know, flat face with, you know, both front facing eyes and very prominent, like round facial disc on all of them, really. They're most active at uh, dawn and dusk. So you'll often see them kind of right in the morning or right, like right before the sun is setting. And they prefer forests and open areas. Uh, which is kind of all of Muskoka is forest in open areas, but our eruptive owl species, so northern hawk owl, uh, snowy owl, uh, great gray owl, they prefer open areas. And our kind of local owls, like this barred owl and this northern sawwood owl, prefer forested areas or areas with a little bit more forest. Uh, so the reason you'll see them a lot at your feeders is if you end up with seed on the ground that attracts rodents like squirrels and mice. And owls like to eat squirrels and mice and mice are pretty active at night. So uh, this guy actually landed on just above one of our feeders and was watching the ground looking for squirrels and mice the whole time he was sitting there. And he actually, uh, there was a barred owl that came this year. So this was last year. This year, another one came. And he made a couple passes at some things under the snow. I don't think he was successful. Um, there was a red squirrel that was antagonizing him for half of the day. Uh, so I'm not sure he was too successful, but you're going to get to see them, you know, when you have mice and stuff out there for them to eat. Uh, and barred owls, especially, they're our most common species in Muskoka. And if you feed birds, you're probably eventually going to see one. You just have to be patient. And look for differences like get used to what you're looking at like what your yard looks like from where you watch birds because both times we saw this owl the first time he was sitting like flush with the trunk of a tree 
And the only reason we saw him is because we're like, wow, that trunk looks kind of weird today. Like something's off about the trunk of the tree that we've been looking at for the last three years. And when you look closer, oh, it's an owl. That's why. Um, and then the one, the time I saw it this year, I was like, jokingly, I had, it had snowed and I saw something was a little off about the tree. And I jokingly was like, oh, there's a barred owl there. And then my eyes focused and I had my coffee and I was like, oh, there's actually a barred owl out there. Um, so they're, they're a bit trickier to see, but if you get used to what your back backyard looks like, you're going to pick out kind of weird shapes a little bit more frequently. Uh, our next group is sparrows. We've talked about them. This is a dark-eyed junco without leucism, so it's a regular-looking one. You have the male in the background, who's that darker kind of almost black color, and the females in the foreground uh, with kind of a little bit more subdued tones, more of a browny color. They're about the size of a chickadee and often a bit larger than a chickadee. Uh, they prefer foraging on the ground like we talked about. Um, they'll actually scuff the ground, so they'll kind of kick back their feet um, to reveal the seeds. And you'll see that, that most often uh, when the seed is all revealed in, the, in kind of late winter, early spring, or when there's, you know, it's snow's all been melted and then we have another kind of light dusting of it, you'll see them kind of kicking back the snow to get to the seeds underneath. Um, our most common winter species are American tree sparrow and dark-eyed junco. So this is the dark-eyed junco. Uh, you can also identify it by that really pink bill. It's got a very pale bill where a lot of spilt sparrows will have a brown or black bill. And then our American tree sparrow uh, looks very different. It's mo much more brown, uh, but it has a bicolored bill. So the black half, black, the top half of the bill is black and the bottom half of the bill is yellow. Um, so that's our American tree sparrow. And they're here really only in the winter. But because they're, they're kind of late to leave to the north, you might get a day where you have American tree sparrow, dark-eyed junco, song sparrow, white crowned sparrow, white-throated sparrow, fox sparrow, all in your yard. So again, you're going you're gonna to be able to start identifying the differences by looking at what birds are hopping around on the ground, which ones are foraging on the ground. If you see that kind of diagnostic scuffing of the ground or that kick with the feet, you'll know it's a sparrow and you can look in your guidebook and say, yeah, this is, this is the species that it is. Um, so they're kind of really neat. And again, most commonly seen kind of in the ground. And if you have any shrubs, they'll kind of duck in and out of the shrubs to feed as well. So it's, it's good to have a little bit of shrubbery near your uh, feeders as well. Um, and our next, next group is finches. This is not the greatest photo of a finch, but finches are kind of hard to take a photo of, at least some of the larger ones. And uh, we've got, a, this one is really hard to break down because we have a huge variety of finch species. So I'm going to try to give you some general rules to help you out, but we have about eight species of finch and they all look very different. So it's tricky to give you some hard and fast rules. Like sparrows are a little bit easier because they're all going to act pretty much the same. Finches are a little bit more difficult. So the first thing you can look for is this red slash yellow coloration. So we saw our evening grosbeak is a finch. It was the yellow. This is a red cross bill. So um, the photo is not great, but you can see kind of a reddish, pinkish, orange color. That's the male. The female is going to be this more muted yellow gray coloration. Um, white wing cross bills look like this guy, except they've got a white wing bar. Um, and then the females, same, look like the female red crossbill. They just have a white wing bar. Uh, pine grosbeaks is another species of finch we have. The males are pink. The females are gray slash yellow. Uh, so looking for that gray slash yellow and the red coloration will help you with some of these finch species. Purple finches, pink slash red. The females are brown. So uh, red, yellow is... Uh, fairly common throughout the whole family. There's a couple exceptions to the rule, but that's going to help you narrow it down. They tend to have a larger bill for eating seeds and kind of a bulkier bill. So it, where our sparrows have a very triangular bill, kind of a small triangular bill, 
and our warblers and uh, blackbirds have more thinner bills. Our finches have really bulky specialized bills. So you can sort of see it in this photo, but it cross bill actually the bill crosses. So the top half like kind of like cuts down and the bottom half cuts up. So they have like a crossed bill. Uh, and it's still pretty bulky. Our gross beak, we saw that evening gross beak with a really bulky pale bill. So looking at the bill shape is going to help you with those guys. Um, and they're seen on the ground or at niger feeders. So our small finches are going to be going to niger feeders. That's your red poles, your goldfinch, your siskins. Um, and the larger finches might feed on the ground. Or the other place to look for them is the top of conifers. So pine gross beaks seem to not come to feeders as often in Muskoka. Uh, crossbills, I don't think I've ever seen at a feeder, but you'll see them at the top of conifers nearby. So look at the top of conifers for some of those species, um, but also niger feeders will be pretty common for some of your kind of like smaller finch species. And like I said, huge variety of species. We have white-winged and red crossbills. We've got American goldfinch. We have pine siskin. We've got evening grosbeak, pine grosbeak, common red pole, hoary red pole, purple finch, maybe a house finch. So <laughs> lots and lots of species that look pretty different. But hopefully this gives you some tips as to what, what you're going to be looking for with the, that variation. Uh, our other group is woodpeckers. Um, this is one of the last groups we'll cover. They're, I mean, the name kind of gives it away, woodpecker. They're birds that peck wood. Uh, so they're larger birds. They tend to be larger birds with a long, thin bill. You can see this hairy woodpecker has that long, thin bill for hammering into trees. You're going to see them on suet feeders. Uh, if you have a suet feeder that's like wood with suet, I know someone had like drilled holes in a piece of wood and hammered suet in there, and the woodpeckers loved that. Uh, they're, they tend to be black and white, and then the males will have some red on the crown. Like pileated woodpeckers, you know, have that really bright red crest, and they're huge. Um, downies and hairies are, you know, more like this. This is a hairy with a red on the back. Red-bellied woodpeckers are kind of black and white with a red um, hat as well. And the most common species we get are downy, hairy, and pileated. And hairy and downy look very similar. A couple differences, uh, large, much longer bill on the hairy woodpecker. You see it's like two thirds of the, sh the size of the head. So that's a good, you know, two thirds to a half the size of the head is usually a hairy. The other more fine tip for these guys is this white out outer tail feathers right here. The downies have little... Uh, black markings on the white tail feathers. So if you if they're on your suet feeders, you can usually get a look at this. Um, and someone says, I think, yeah, downy is a downsized hairy. Exactly. Yeah, they're much smaller. So think of a downy as like, uh, yeah, downy is a small woodpecker. Think of them as like the size of a white-breasted nuthatch. They're slightly bigger than that. And then the hairies are like the size of, more like the size of a blue jay. However, you can see ones that are more similar in size. So the bill is, is probably the best way of telling the difference. That really long bill is the hairy. And the downy's bill, what it kind of looks like is it looks like a little protrusion from a like a big bunch of feathers because they have the, like these feathers right at the tip of their bill. Because the downy is, is so small, the bill is so small, it looks like you know, a huge puff of feathers, even though it's about the same size. Um, and then pileated wood, woodpeckers are like one of the biggest woodpeckers we ha have. They're those huge black woodpeckers with a bright red crest. They're pretty obvious when you do see one. Uh, we've got the last kind of group of birds I'm going to cover is blackbirds. And it's probably something you don't really have at this time, but you're going to be having around the end of February. I think the earliest we've had blackbirds are is like February 28th or something. They're typically all black. Uh, and the best way to identify the different types of them is looking at the eye color and then bill shape. So these are European starlings. Uh, 
they're technically not they're like a old world blackbird they're from europe so they're not the same genus or family as our blackbirds but i like to group them in because they look pretty similar they've got this long pointed yellow bill black eye uh, when we're looking at our common species like red winged blackbird they've got a black eye black bill um, and they've got a kind of thin uh pointy black bill um, and then obviously red winged blackbird they've got a bright red patch on the wing <laughs> uh, and then our common grackle are gonna have a lighter eye but a more kind of bulky down curved bill and then brown-headed cowbirds they have a dark eye and a really bulky conical bill uh, so there's you know some variation in our our blackbirds but the best way is eye color and bill shape if you can get a feel for what the, the different blackbirds are that's the easiest way to tell them um and then again they they come in late winter early spring like we probably will see them in about two weeks uh there looks like there's a warm spell next week where it gets to like two degrees for three days uh hopefully that doesn't come true but if that does come true you may see them as early as then uh the red winged blackbirds will, will really start coming as soon as uh as soon as the water opens up and they can access some of their food um, but yeah, look for the all blackbirds. Uh, and again, you're gonna you're gonna see big flocks of them for sure in the spring. Uh, and the actually the one other thing is if you look at this far right bird here, you can see there's uh, or you might be able to see some purple, some blue, some green on them. They have what's called an iridescent uh, plumage. So they actually it kind of changes with the way the light works. Um, and common common grackles are another one. This is really obvious with where the iridescent will change the feather color. So just because you've got a really purple headed looking bird doesn't necessarily mean it's a new species. It might just be the way the light's hitting the bird. So then our the last thing I wanted to kind of hit this video again, because we talked about the three species that show up in this, this video we didn't talk about. And I got to try to pause it um, if it plays. Okay, I can't pause it. So the first bird is a red-breasted nuthatch. That's a chickadee. And there's a white-breasted nuthatch. I'll play it again if I can. So there's our red-breasted nuthatch. There's our chickadee. That's the quintessential winter bird. And then our white-breasted nuthatch there. And the way you tell the difference between the two nuthatches, the red-breasted, if we look again, has that black line right through the eye and the white breasted doesn't have a black line they both have a black cap but uh i'll play this video again maybe so look as the red breasted nuthatch flies down you'll see a black line through the eye and a kind of rufous on the underside there's that black line that's how you tell the difference when we look at the white breasted nuthatch no black line through the eye so you can see when it turns its head it's all white on the side of the face there's also a size difference that you can get pretty comfortable with once you look at them a lot. Um, but I can't judge size of birds, so I always have to look for other things. Um, some people are really good at it. I'm very bad at it. So size is never one of my identifying features for any of the birds I look at. So now I'd like to open up for questions. Um, also, if you'd like to try to guess what this bird is, um, so the reason I included this bird is this is the reason why you need to get familiar with everything around you, because this is something that would stick out like a sore th thumb if you saw it at your feeders, because it is not something we regularly see. It has been seen in Muskoka, but not regularly. And I'll give, you know, a couple minutes or a couple seconds if people want to try to guess. It is a thrush. Um, it is a thrush. I can tell you it's it's of the thrush family. So you can see it kind of looks superficially or the body shape is kind of like a robin would be. Like it's kind of standing like how a robin would. Um, this is a Karen, Karen Mason got it, buried thrush. Karen's, Karen used to live in BC. So <laughs> these are native to BC and occasionally they'll they'll get lost and fall and end up in Ontario. So this one was photographed in Halliburton. Um, on January 4th of 2020, I want to say. Uh, we did a nice 12-hour drive birding trip. 
It's like we went out to Halliburton, then drove down to Prince Edward County for uh, spotted towie that came from BC as well. Uh, so it's like 12 hours of driving for two birds, but uh, that's a life of hardcore birders. So yes, very thrush. They've shown up in Muskoka before. They'll show up again. And it just looks so different than anything else you will see in the winter that it's something that, you know, would pop out and, and kind of be pretty obvious. Um, so if you'd like to enter uh, any questions, I, I have tried to answer most of the ones as they've come in, but feel free to raise your hand or write in the chat. I do have one question about nut hatches. So where do they fit? Uh, are they finches? Are they sparrows? They're neither. Uh, nut hatches are their only are their own group of birds. Same with chickadees. Chickadees and nut nut hatches are kind of their own separate groups of birds, which is why there wasn't really an easy way to group them. And the reason you know it's not a sparrow is because they don't really feed on the ground that often. Often you'll see them kind of flying in from trees or feeding in the top of trees. Uh, they, they tend to stay, if you think of sparrows as like ground birds, and then you think of like a canopy as another layer, like the in-between layer of like between the ground and the canopy of trees is another group of birds that use that. And that's kind of where the chickadees and the nuthatches fall in. And that you will see them up in the canopies, you will see them on the ground, but usually when you're seeing them, it, it's that kind of in-between layer of the forest. Uh, we've had a bunch of starlings all winter. Any way to discourage them? Yeah, it's tricky. I think you're kind of stuck with starlings. Um, if you don't use millet, so we have starlings that nest at our neighbors. I don't know if they're there this winter, but they've been there in the past winters and they have never come to our feeders except in the spring for only a very little amount of time. If you're using millet, they're definitely going to come. If you use a mix of seeds that don't have millet, you might have less. I can't, I can't guarantee them. They're tricky um, because they will eat a lot of stuff. Uh, we found we we made a peanut butter feeder last year, and they were the only bird that used them. So that was fun. Uh, <laughs> we're hoping to attract other things. I would say you might be stuck with them, but if you are using millet, that might be a better or like cutting the millet out and just using straight black oil sunflower might help. If you're not using millet, then you might just be stuck with them. Um, how to keep squirrels out of bird feed. Uh, there are squirrel proof feeders. That's one way. There's some ways you can like wrap um, like metal around the bottom of poles to stop them. I've heard people like grease their poles. Um, we just, have given up honestly like we just let them eat bird seed there's like a group of feeders they don't come to which are a bunch of like squirrel proof feeders and then they're like they're allowed to access the feeders at the back like the platform feeder and the hopper at the back uh i always just think of it as you know they're food for hawks and owls so if i have squirrels one of those will come by and get one of them so I don't think of it as feeding the squirrels. I think about it as feeding the hawks. <laughs> That's how I justify it to myself. Uh, list of common birds in Muskoka. There's not, uh, I mean, there's a couple lists out there, but the easiest way is if you go to eBird, there are ways to look at um, Muskoka County. So you can explore by region and you can explore M Muskoka County. And the easiest way, there's a couple like checklists, like some illustrated checklists that actually show frequency of birds. Um, and you can look through that and, you know, really rare birds will have like a very thin bar showing their frequency and common birds will have a very wide bar showing their frequency. And it's kind of cool because you can look at, it, it breaks it down by month too. So you'll be able to see which, which birds are more common in which months. So for example, like you'd see that American tree sparrows are super common between uh, October and April, but you, they're not really seen in the summer. Um, and that's because they migrate down here in the winter and then they go back up north in the summer. So I would check out eBird. Uh, some of the apps like Sibley's and iBird is one for iPhone will have kind of like common birds in Muskoka. Um, I know Merlin is another option that I think you can set it. 
but if you'd like a kind of bigger breakdown, just send me a quick email and I can, I can send you some links to what, what the easiest places to find that. Uh, do we get more than one type of chickadee in Muskoka? Someone answers it immediately, boreal chickadee. Yep, we get two types, uh, black cap chickadee being the super common one, boreal chi chickadee being the super rare one. There's no like in between for chickadees. It's either super rare or super common. Uh, boreal chickadees used to be a lot more common in Muskoka, but they've kind of been getting pushed out because the boreal habitat is disappearing here. Uh, boreal chickadees have a brown cap and a uh, brown back, brown on their back and their wings. So that's how you tell the difference. Look for the brown cap. Uh, it's not something you'll see a lot, but you, if you live up kind of Huntsville or even north of Huntsville, you, you might see a few more. Uh, oh, the other thing I would add about feeders and squirrels, I know someone that attaches string to an arrow and shoots the arrow over a branch and then ties down the string to lift up the feeder. And that way the squirrels can't access the feeder. But, uh, you know, there's, there's some that, you know, someone is mentioning one that drops to cover the holes. I've got some of that, uh, or I've got a few of those that work really well. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of squirrel buster feeders. You're going to have to play around. There's no tried or true me method to, uh, beating them and we've just ended up thinking you know if i change my mindset to i'm feeding the hawks then it feels a little bit better <laughs> um and like uh the i've got property out east of brace bridge um that i am you know, going, going to build on and i've set up feeders and i got raccoons that raid my feeders so they like will actually grab on with the front paws to the bottom of the hopper and then pull up their back paws to the other side of the hopper and just like shovel the food straight into their mouth. So, uh, you know, I, I've kind of, I've kind of adopted the live and let live and, you know, let them eat some seeds, but, you know, know that, you know, there are options out there. It's just going to take a bit more work. Uh, Martha is asking about the owl conservation area on Wolf and Amherst Island. I have been there. I saw zero owls. <laughs> if you're lucky, you can see like eight species of owls in a day. Um, and like up until the day I went, people were seeing short-eared owl, long-eared owl, a bunch of different owl species. Um, I would recommend it. I loved it, even though I didn't see a single owl. I loved it. And if you get lucky, you can see a lot of cool stuff. Um, and the ferry is, I can't remember whether it's free or a very nominal charge, but you can drive right on the front ferry. They'll take you over. You can drive around and see a bunch of different owls. So uh, highly recommend the Amherst Island if you can get out there in the winter. And February is a great time to go. Um, and you'll see some cool owls out there, hopefully. Unless you get my luck and you won't see anything. I mean, I did have a rough-legged hawk and a kestrel, so I can't com complain that much, but there were no owls that I saw. So um, I think that looks like all the questions I have. Um, so this is going to be saved. I will be uploading it to YouTube. You can view it later and I'll send out the link. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any other questions if you want to send me an email. I love talking about birds, so send me an email. If you got photos of weird, weird birds, send me the photo and I can, you know, try to figure out what it is. And if it's something super rare, you'll be getting a call from me saying, when did you last see this? And can I come? <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm glad. Uh, hope hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, the, uh, there will probably be webinars moving into the future as well. I think we'll have some in, I think there's one scheduled for April and May. So um, yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in and have, have fun birding, good birding. <laughs>